pray. Father, I'm so grateful for an opportunity again to, to speak to your children. Father, I thank you, God, that we gathered together this morning, not as strangers, but as family. And Father, I thank you that, that you love to open your word to us and speak to us. So, Father, I invite your Holy Spirit to come and, and to speak truth to our hearts. Father, I pray that, that your words today would not fall on, uh, on the wayside in our hearts, but it would find good soil to produce fruit that remains in our lives. Father, I thank you for, for all that you have planned for us. God, that you have a, a plan for a good future for each of our lives. Father, that you have a plan of peace. And, Father, we invite that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've been doing a series um, on Jesus is the answer, and Dad opened the series up with this with a story about when he used to do children's church. There was a um, little boy, and whenever they asked questions uh, during the children's <coughs> church service, the little boy would uh, raise his hand, get really excited, and he would always answer Jesus. And I remember growing up in the church myself, you know, and going off to Bible college, you know, a good. They used to, we used to joke and say a good Bible college answer would be Jesus. Like if any question was asked, just say Jesus and you, you got it right, you know. Um, but it seems like sometimes as we grow, we forget the simplicity of the answer actually really compounded. And it really is the answer to every question that we have. It's the answer to every problem, everywhere, it's Jesus. And so this morning, um, the topic is repentance. Jesus is the answer, repent. And many times when we uh, think about repentance, I, I grew up in a military um, town, and so repentance is talked a lot about, about faith. So if um, they're going to march, they're marching orders, and somebody says repent, then to repent would be to turn around completely. And I think most times when I've talked about repentance, or when I learned about repentance or when I was younger, most of the time it had to do with uh, stop doing what you're doing and do something else. And so it was in that, in that understanding, you know, okay, if I was doing something wrong, I knew, okay, stop doing it, change and do this. And it was focused a lot on the behavior modification, changing the way I behave, changing what I do. And so I grew up knowing that, okay, if I do this, and the Bible says don't do it, then I don't do it. Or I would stop this, okay, I need to stop this. And in my own power, usually, I would try to change or modify my behavior so I would look more like Jesus. And as I've as I have uh, understood repentance and growing and understanding Jesus is the answer, that is far beyond just a behavior modification. Repentance is not just about the change of my change of behavior, but it's actually, it goes deeper than that. Repentance is the change of belief. So when we change our belief, when we change the core of who we are, it changes what we do. So for many years, we, I, I, you know, change, I'm trying to change what I do, change what I do, change what I do. But then God said, no, you must change what you believe. And as you change what you believe, it changes who you are. And then, change what you do. If you've been transformed, your identity has been transformed, you change the way you act when you do things. So, um, Matthew 4, 17. Jesus makes this statement. He's getting ready for his public ministry. Matthew 4, verse 17, says this. So for the time, for that time, uh, Jesus began to preach. He preached, repent, for the kingdom of God has come here. Yeah, Jesus wasn't, he wasn't calling the Pharisees or the religious leaders or the Jewish people that day just to change or modify their behavior. The, if we know anything about the religious leaders of the day, they were experts at changing their behavior. They made laws upon laws, right? To, so that they would not even get close to breaking the true law of God. So they lived all these things out in order to modify what they did, hopefully not to break the command of God. So Matthew 15 um, is a kind of is a little story of Jesus confronting this. Matthew chapter 15. We're going to read uh, 1 through 12 together. It says this, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, 
And why do you break the command of God? For the sake of the tradition. For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, and their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And Jesus says, uh, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. So here again, Jesus is uh, emphasizing here that it's not about what what they are doing. So they, they made these laws outside the laws in order to protect themselves from breaking that. And he, he mentions this passage in Isaiah, which is where the, the heart of this message will come from, is verse 8 and 9, that these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And so one passage in the New Testament that always makes me ask it, like, when I read this passage, I always, like, check myself with God. I say, God, is this, um, like, could I be one of these people? There's a passage that mentions that there be many that come to God and say, Lord, Lord, right? But he'll say, um, he'll say, turn away from me, for I never knew you. So they did, all, and they say, there's these people that they did all these good things for him. They, they fed the poor, they, they closed people, but then he's going to come to them and he's going to say, hey, I never knew you. And every time I think about this, I, I, I think to myself, wow, do I, am, do I know God in my heart? Do I believe Him in my heart? And does it produce the good works that I do? Or am I chasing after the good things that I do and never knowing Him or believing Him in my heart? Am I just changing my behavior but not truly believing on Him in my heart? So I believe that uh, what we do comes from who we are. That's where Jesus is. This is where Jesus really gets at with his with the religious leaders and with us today. He would ask us. He would tell us what you do comes out of who you are. So and who you are. So sometimes I say, Oh, who am I? So I'm Andrew Kestrova. I'm you know Pastor Bob's son. You know I'm a husband to Rachel. But who you are really is the core. The core of who you are. What you believe. It, it, it's 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 your essence. Your character. Who you are. So out of that comes what you do. And you're like, oh, really? Well, I can give a, give a little example. So um, I had a friend tell me a story this week of their their daughter. And their daughter, they, they train their daughter uh, in their home, you know, to love Jesus, to be, you know, to be kind to your to your neighbor, to share your, to share her toys. She was younger um, in elementary school. They share her toys, to be kind. Uh, to love the little girls that she's playing with on the playground and everything like that. Well then, uh, and at home, and uh, when the parents were around, they, they saw that. They were like, okay, she's, she's behaving correctly. She's following our rules in our home. She's doing well. Well, uh, one day they get a phone call from the school. And he was like, when, you know, we got a phone call from the school, and of course, the school called and said, your daughter is the best student ever. You know, she's, she's friendly to everybody. She's the model student. She studies really hard. She makes great grades. You know, even when we have school assemblies, we bring your daughter up and we, we stand her up on the stage and tell everybody, you need to be like your, uh, I'll give her, her name was Maggie. So you need to be like Maggie. You guys know that wasn't what the, the school never calls to say that, right? No, they called because Maggie had, um, said something really negative to her neighbor. So he goes, we admit, Maggie, they usually got phone calls because Maggie was a school bully. And whenever she was at school, she was always mean to people. Like one of the things that this particular call was, that um, there was a, they went into class and one of the girls that sat next to her in class um, smelled. And so Maggie turned to her and said, I don't want to sit by you. You stink. And, and the girl cried and then went home and told her mom 
what Maggie had said, and the parent called the school, and the school called, you know, the, these parents and said, hey, what's going on in Maggie? See, Maggie had learned how to behave, she knows how to, like, all the modification, but who she was in those pressure situations, when somebody stinky is next to her, that jerk, that's, their jerk and little Maggie comes out. Now, I know nobody in this room has ever had that experience either, right? Where, you know, we can, we can come Sunday morning, and we all know each other, have a happy face, greet each other, but then in a pressure situation during the week, there's something that comes out, and you're like, I don't know what that was. Anybody? Nobody else but me. I, I know this. So I'll just preach to myself today. But uh, there's moments that, that things happen around us, and all of a sudden these things come out. And I believe, like Jesus gets that, this is, this is something that's going on in our heart, a belief, a wrong belief that we have in our heart, and it comes out in everyday life situations. Sometimes it may be because of stress, maybe something good going on, and you realize, hey, how prideful you are. Hey, your life is going great, and all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, I got it all together. Well, wait a second, that's probably some pride. What are you believing in your heart? So this morning, I want to go through um, a tool that will help us to work on this repentance. Finding out where in our hearts we do not believe Jesus is the answer. And it will help us that in moments of life when things happen, we're like, whoa, where did that come from? Okay, let's examine our hearts, to find out where this unbelief is so that we can submit, our goal is, right, as disciples of Jesus, to submit all of life to the Lordship of Jesus. So sometimes we realize that Part of our life is not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. See, I believe He is calling us to change, but He's calling us to be more like Him. And it's on a belief level that we become more and more like Jesus. But uh, this is what I, I wrote this down. I was like, squared it off sometimes and make notes. I talk, I, anyway, and I said, we can change what we do. But we can't. But sometimes we don't change our heart. Yeah, we can change what we do and never submit to the lordship of Jesus. So we need to we need to work on a heart level, submitting ourselves to the lordship of Jesus, and then out of that abundance will come a change of a change of behavior. See, right? We, before disciples, John um, John fifteen eight says that we'll bear much fruit. In Matthew three verse eight, it says that we should produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So this fruit of our life that comes out, sometimes we realize it's bad fruit. It actually isn't the fruit of repentance, right? And you guys may have remembered um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, right? When we were younger, maybe uh, we had memorized that for Sunday school or something. But Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23 is the fruit of the Spirit. And it lists these fruit of the Spirit, fruit of Jesus, these fruit that when our lives are aligned with Jesus, then these fruit will be produced. So these fruit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those fruits sound a lot like Jesus, right? I want to be like them. I want, I want those kind of fruit to be produced in my life all the time. So that when I'm interacting with my wife, she tastes of God's goodness in her, and she tastes of God's patience, and she tastes of God's love and joy when I'm interacting with uh, my unbelieving friends in my neighborhood, that they get to taste of, of Jesus, of His Spirit. So how do we produce this? Where do we, where do we go from here? So let's um, I'm gonna do a little diagram. I had this out to draw because I literally, I literally sometimes in my journal will write, the, will draw this diagram out to help me see where, what am I believing in my heart? Where is this repentance happening? Uh, it, it, what am I truly believing? One more verse before I get into it. And I'm, I'm trying to take hours of what I want to say and say it in one hour. So let's turn one more verse. I didn't have this down, but go to Romans with me. Romans chapter 1. So Jesus is saying it's about what's in you, and it comes out, right? We're going to do a series in the gospel here soon, and I'll probably use these 
passages again, but Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is a, this is a, this is a, a really important verse. All of Romans is awesome. And, and Paul actually takes all of Romans and unpacks this one verse. I'm just going to say a little bit about it. Because Romans, I mean, it's, it's mean, but it's really good. Romans 1, verse 16. Great verse. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And most of the time when we use that verse in church, we're always, we talk about evangelism. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Go out there and share the gospel. But this, let's unpack it. This, let's see the rest of this verse. It's really, really key to understanding this belief issue, this fruit issue. It says this, Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Why is, this, why is this so integral when we're talking about repentance? We're talking about getting free from these, this bad fruit in our life. The gospel. The gospel is the good news. It is who God is and what he's done. The gospel is good news. That good news is the power of God for salvation. It brings salvation. Okay, so salvation. Here, let's break this down a little bit. What is the word salvation? Salvation, a lot of times, right? We think about salvation. We think about um, when I came to know Jesus, now I'm saved, now I have salvation. When I die, I will get in a, good, a, better, a better place than those that don't have salvation, right? That's our basic understanding, usually, of salvation in the church. Okay, I received Jesus, and now I got my ticket to heaven. I'm good. But this word salvation is, it, the actual word in Greek is so, so. Why is that so important? Because it means restoration. So, the gospel, who God is, what he's done, is the power of God that brings salvation, that brings restoration. He's restoring us back into relation with him. He's restoring our body, soul, and spirit. Our whole being is being restored back to God. So, the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. And then it puts this, this last, you know, if I was an English major, what is this prepositional phrase, right? But, to everyone who believes... Qualifier. So the gospel brings salvation, it brings restoration to those who believe. So then what is my responsibility then? To believe the gospel. When I believe the gospel, I experience salvation. I experience restoration. I, I experience the peace of God. I experience all the things the gospel brings. I experience it once I believe. So when we're talking about repentance, if we're if we have bad fruit in our lives, we can repent, we can change what we're doing. Okay, maybe I have an anger issue. I can say, okay, this is a bad fruit that doesn't line up with the fruit of the spirit that we just read. Or I don't have peace, or I have anxiety, right? I have fear in my life. It doesn't line up, so I can change, I can say, stop that, right? Has anybody told you that before? Stop that, or or don't worry, be happy, right? We get those, you know? But sometimes it's it's, it, it goes deeper than that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to fear. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to have peace. Okay, be happy. You know, don't be angry. Be glad. I mean, you know, we can do that, but it's, it's a deeper thing. If we what we believe in our heart will produce the good fruit that that um, that we have. It's a principle of the gospel. If we believe it, we'll experience the gospel. So let's look here. I'm going to use one that's. Um, I'm going to use one example today, but I'm going to start with a tree. So we're talking about, I'm not going to spill her. Okay. Uh, I'm um, a great artist. This is my fruit tree. It kind of looks like a cookie too. <laughs> All right, um, but it's a fruit tree, and <laughs> and so the, the, we have we have the fruit the fruit that comes in our life, right? Jesus says, it, Jesus said again, right, that that we need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So fruit in our life, sometimes we got um, some good fruit. Sometimes I'm like, all right, Andrew, you got a you got a golden star for patience today. And other days I don't, right? So, um, but we're going to use anxiety. As a fruit, um, a bad fruit. Oh, I think I spelled that wrong. I think 
use it in for other. Sorry, guys. So we got anxiety in our lives. What kind of what would be what would be an example of a reason to to, to be anxious? Too much month and not enough money. Too much month and not enough money. <laughs> that would that could cause some anxiety, right? New situations. What's that? New situations. New and new situations. situations. You're in a new environment. And you're like anxious about it. It's causing some. Oh, I don't know about this, right? Job What's that? Job searching. Job searching. Am I ever going to find a job? I just went to five years or eight years of college, right? Get my get my undergrad and my graduate degree. Now I got to find a job. I know some Purdue students, some UW students, and that's both that can fix my diet. Or I miss the one take the tests. I'm in school, or, or Dion, right? Dion had to take a test to get to Epic this week. Like, that, that can create some anxiety, right? So there's some things in our life that cause anxiety. I, I don't think anxiety in itself is a sin, right? Sometimes we have feelings that come up in our in our heart. Sometimes there's a there's frustration or sometimes there's anxiety. But sometimes our feelings can show us that the, in our heart there's a belief that is off. So it's not in line with the fruit of the spirit. Um, I'll give an example for, for Rachel and I. When Rachel um, got a diagnosis from the doctor that um, that she had a health, that her health issue wasn't healed. It created anxiety. So in so this is the this is the fruit. And the question that I always ask myself when I'm when I'm thinking about the fruit is uh, the question is like what do I do? What am I what am I doing? What is what do I do? Like what is the what is the thing that I'm examining that is off? Am I getting angry? Am I have, do I have anxiety? Do I have a lack of peace in my heart? I want to use this question, and sometimes I don't always draw the truth, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I will always ask that question. What do, what do I do? What am I doing? What action am I experiencing? Or what emotion am I experiencing? What thing am I experiencing that is not in line with the fruit of the Spirit? So one time I was in conversation with Rachel about this, and she was, she was really anxious. Um, actually, there was a time a couple years ago where not only dealing with anxiety, but depression, and just uh, just in a really, um, wasn't experiencing joy. Like, I was like, it's really evident there's no joy in her heart. And um, so I was asking, you know, what what's going on? What are you doing? I see this anxiety, what's going on? And Rachel was like, identifying um, with me, hey, you know, when we received the diagnosis that we did, I mean, it really, it really got to me, like, what I, what I'm believing about myself, about uh, this, this situation. Um, and so the second question is, okay, what am I doing? You're examining what you're doing. The second question that I ask is, is who am I? Or what's happening inside of me when this, when this anxiety is happening? What's What's happening inside of my heart? And, and Rachel, one of the things that we talked about a lot was, um, it's like, you know, this health situation, I feel like it always comes up and I never expect it. Like, okay, um, one of the things with her, with her health is, is hey, when, when it comes up, it's not like something the doctors can monitor or like the doctors can predict is gonna happen, but every so often this issue Resurfaces. It's not something they can tell. Hey, this is going to happen at this moment. At this moment, it just happens again. So she she struggles with the feeling of being out of control, and it creates anxiety. I can't control it. I can't predict it. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it, when a new situation, you move to a new place, right? And there's there's all these things I can't control. What's going to happen? My, I don't know what the boss is going to be like. I don't know what what neighborhood I want to be in is it, creating some anxiety. And so um, so she would say. Sometimes she would say. I, I'm in control, actually. And she's like, I'm in control. I want to be in control. Like, you know, I want to have this control in my life. And she, but the, the thing was, she's not in control. Who am I? She's not in control. Or, we'll just put not in control. Yeah. 
One of the things with this um, process is it really takes some honesty. You need to be honest with what's going on in your heart. When you're experiencing this group, what, what is happening? Let's ask some questions. And it's, 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 sometimes it isn't as quick as, okay, ask these, ask these two questions, and boom, all of a sudden you got, you got what the results were. And sometimes it just, just continue to ask your own self the question and be honest. What, is, what are you experiencing? I'm experiencing anxiety because I want to be in control. I can't control anything. Like they, she, uh, at the time also, she was working at a daycare and, and had you know, 20 kids in her room. Plunk with one, just herself. It was a terrible situation. She's totally out of control. She can't control the kids. She can't control our health. She can't control our finances. She can't control anything. I'm out of control and it's causing anxiety. So this is where it turns on our, our, our fruit, who we are, what we're believing about, what are we believing about ourselves. It changes to what we believe about God. So we ask, ask this question, what has God done? But in these moments of um, anxiety, feeling out of control, what do we believe about God? What is this showing us that we believe about what God has done? And again, it takes honesty, right? I mean, this isn't like, this is like, oh, you know, some things about, some, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you know, some things, sometimes I read the book of Psalms and I read like David's lamenting to God and I'm like, man, David sounds like a really, uh, like an unbeliever sometimes. He's just like confessing all these really negative things, right? And I'm like, I can never do that. Can I really say these like things that I'm really feeling? But our confession brings healing, right? So, what we got to the core saying, okay, Rachel, what are you believing that God has done? And she's like, you know what? If I'm really honest, it's like, I, re I really believe God's abandoned me. You know, I when she was um in high school and this health situation happened, there was a 24 period of time that something, uh, one of her levels in her body needed to rise. And if it didn't, they're gonna to have to do all these different operations and tests. And miracle happened, and with, with less than, it was like eight hours later, all of a sudden that number that they're looking at rise without any, any um, medical reason other than the fact God healed her body and, and restored her to health. Awesome. So, but then in her, now we're in college and it happens again. Okay, what? So God healed me then and now he's abandoned. And she's like, I feel abandoned. I don't feel in control of this situation. I don't feel like God's in control of it. He's totally left me to deal with it on my own. Then within, so that thinking, um, well, he stopped loving her. Now that's, that's, that's a hard one. Like, I don't know, maybe you've been in that situation where Oh, I feel like you know God is all loving. He's accepting of me. He loves me. But then this situation happening. What? What? Is, you know, now all of a sudden, God stopped loving me. Sometimes we have to be honest. Maybe that's some uh, belief that creeps up in our heart. Yeah. I'm mean, anxious because I feel like God stopped loving me. All of a sudden, all this terrible things happening. What else? And we get we get down uh, to it, and we said, you know, that. Um, That God lost control. It's a belief in our heart. So then, then I, then I will always ask, who is God? So if this is what you believe is happening, then what God are you serving? Who is God in this situation? Oh, if I'm honest, I believe that God is distant. I'm loving. But input stand, we're not powerful. And immediately, so we get to this point of confession, right? We're saying, 
okay, I have anxiety in my life, I feel like I'm in control, wait, I'm really not in control, I, I'm believing, I may be believing that God's abandoned me, that he stopped loving me, and the situation is beginning to convince me that he's even lost control. So when you think about it, the God that, that Rachel is believing in, the God that Rachel was, was worshiping in that moment, if I want to go there, was a God that was distant, unloving, and not powerful. And in, those, in that moment, what is what is it? What is she saying? No, that's not. That's not. That's not who God is. Right? It's not, that's not. That's not the God that I know. That's not the God that the God I know is 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 here with me. The God that I know is loving. The God that I know is is powerful. And sometimes in, in my situation as a as a missionary, I, I get uh, like financial support. The people around the globe they send me monthly support, and and there's sometimes that things are like uh, all good, and I got the full paycheck, and we're like, okay, we pay our bill. And some months where it's a little tighter, and and sometimes I have to remember. So all of a sudden, that will create anxiety in my heart. Okay, I, my bills, my my month is longer than my than my income, right? And then I start getting some anxiety. I start getting, sometimes I get some fear. What's going to happen if, if I don't pay this bill? Or what, what's going to happen at the end of the month when, when I know the insurance comes out on the 30th of the month? What if I don't have that money for that thing? It creates some fear in my life. And I start believing some things about me. Hey, I'm not, I'm not able to provide for myself. I'm, I'm lost. I'm, I'm no good. Uh, what are people going to think about me? I can't pay my bills. What are people going to think about me? I'm living on faith and God isn't providing for me. I start thinking all, all these things about myself, right? And then I start thinking things about God. If I'm, I'm, I have fear in my life, I'm thinking, well, God's, God's forgotten about me. God's not going to be my provider. Who is the God that I'm serving? A God that doesn't care about me, that's, that, that has left me for my own. Right? And I get to that point, too, and I'm like, no! That's not what I believe. So I could be, at this point, okay, Andrew, don't, don't worry about your bills if we pay. You know, I can just deal with it there. I got fear about my bills. Okay. Or Rachel got some anxiety about the, um, the issue with the health thing. Okay, just don't worry about it. Or whatever situation you're going through that's causing you situation, you can, you can do the Christianese. Okay, don't worry about it. Just stop it. Just repent. Lie to Jesus. It's cool. But when we get down to this level and we realize that it's, it's actually a belief, a belief issue, a worship issue that is causing this anxiety, then... True repentance can happen. A change of belief in our heart. No, this isn't what I believe about God. And I repent. I change what I do. I repent. No, God, that isn't who you are. See, in Romans chapter 2, This is this about Romans chapter, um, sorry, chapter 1, verse 22. It says this, Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animal. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desire of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Verse 25 says this, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever to be praised. Sometimes if we're honest with ourselves, we start, we begin to worship a false God, and it produces this bad fruit. We exchange the truth about God, or just about to go through, for a lie, and it causes bad fruit in our lives. I'm worshiping. I, I, if I, I'm, I'm dealing with the fear, with the financial issue, and I believe in God's not a. I'm believing in a God that isn't a provider. But that's not the truth about the God that we serve, right? Mm -hmm. God that we serve is, is loving and accepting and pro provides for our needs. So I repent. I change what I believe, and it's going to produce in me a different action, a different response. 
So I ask these same four questions again on this side. Who is God? Is he distant? No. Actually, the, the Word of God says that he never leaves me nor forsakes me, right? He actually, um, if we look at Jesus, we look at the Gospel, he said that he's going to leave us, he's going to give us a comforter, right? That's going to be with us all the time. So, who is God? He's near to me, right? How do I, how do I know this? Let's look at the Gospel, right? How do I know that God is near to me? We know He sent the Holy Spirit. Right? What do we believe? John chapter 16. He's sending the Holy Spirit to be a comforter, right? He's going to lead us and guide us into all truth. We're never going to be alone. Never. It's a belief change. Okay, what about unloving? Well, we know, right, or we can at least conclude, maybe using a simple verse like John 3, 16, but we know that we are loved, right? We are His beloved children. So I know that I'm loved. The, the Bible reveals this to me. But, but then, uh, through Scripture, but then how do I know this? In the life of Jesus, how do I know that I'm loved? The Holy Spirit reveals it to me, yes. And I know that I'm loved because of the cross. Man, I, I have infinite value to God. He sent His only Son. I am a loved child of God. And we know through Romans that the Holy Spirit tells us this. He tells us that we're His children, that we're loved. So whenever, whenever circumstances, circumstances sometimes will dictate what we believe about God, now, on this side, when we're thinking about the truth about God, we look at the gospel. We look at Jesus and we say, what about Jesus? What about the gospel speaks this truth to me? I am loved. Why? The cross tells me I am a loved child of God. He's not powerful. Well, right, we know that he is powerful. How do, we, how do we see that in Jesus? How do we see the power of God demonstrated in Jesus? Well, I want to say, um, especially, especially when we think about healing, when we think about the, the healings that Jesus did, I mean, he showed power over demons, he showed power over blindness, over all sorts of sickness, right? But in the cross, when it looked like the story of God was at the very end, think about this, the Messiah, right? We know this the story of Jesus, the Messiah, the one, the true coming king, the one who is going to establish his kingdom, the, to reign and rule forever, the, you know, the restoration of the kingdom of David, and all these kind of things, the Messiah, the, the king, is now dead in a grave. Now, if at, any, if at any point in history it looked like things were out of God's control, I would pick that as a, as a, as a point. Okay, his, the Messiah has come, the Son of God has come, and now he's dead in a grave. End of story, right? It looks miserable. I would hate to be in that position. Maybe you're, you're down on you're down on your luck. You, 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 you know, you're looking for a job. You can't find things. Things look out of control financially. Things look out of control in your health. Things are out of control. You got kids, and they're going crazy on you. You know, it looks out of control. But in that situation, how do we know God is powerful? Because that wasn't the end of the story. God demonstrated His power. When Christ raised from the dead, and that same power that is in Christ is now in us. I know he's powerful because Jesus raised from the dead. I know it. Now that let me believe on this. Now, what does this produce in me? If I think about who I am, what does this change about who I am? Oh, I'm a child of God. Right? I have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Now what does that produce in my life? Oh, man. Peace. 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 No matter what, wow, no matter what, you know, we're to like get through this and like no matter what's gonna come my way, I know, I am convinced, I believe in my heart that God is in control. It changes how I respond to things. Now all of a sudden last year she gets in a car accident and uh, totals our, our car. And 
They were like, okay, now I ain't got no money for this, blah, 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 all these different issues. And we said, you know what? Guys got this. It was, I mean, a totally different response than what it was before. Like, okay, this, I mean, okay, God got this. Three days later, somebody called us and gave us a $13,000 car. I mean, like, God got this. We're not just talking financially, but in any situation, though, when, we con when we're convinced within ourselves that God is who He says He is, Amen. then it changes what we think about ourselves. And then when circumstances come, we produce the fruit of the Spirit instead of the this bad, ugly fruit that comes sometimes comes out right. And sometimes, hey, I'm a work in progress, right? Amen. I told, my, I, told, I, told, I told you guys a couple weeks ago, right? Like, like I'm an unbeliever. Sometimes I got unbelief in my heart, and I'm still working on making Jesus the answer in every area of my life. And this is what this repentance is about. Find those areas in our heart that we still haven't put Jesus as Lord of our life. We still aren't believing the truth of God, and causing this ugliness to be produced in our life. But when we get to this point of repentance, we say, no, it's not true. Help me believe. I think we've said that a few times, right? Help me believe. I mentioned that the, 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 the father who took his, uh, took his son to, to Jesus to be healed, and he said, if you can heal my, um, I think it was a son, but it was demon possessed, if you can. And he said, if I can, I mean, and then the father's response was, help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. That's our same prayer today. Again, when we get to this point, we got this, and we realize, wow, this is what I really believe in about God. And I say, God, help my unbelief. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble. He reinforces himself to us. He, this, I mean, we can do this. This is kind of like an intellectual descent, right? We can like, like go through this intellectually and still sometimes not believe in our heart. But we have, God, help me change my heart that I believe that this is true about you so that it produces in me the fruit that is in accordance to repentance. That I bear fruit. That you really are the tree and I really am the branches. So this morning, I can I believe God is calling us to repentance. That doesn't have to be a hard word. I think I used to cringe whenever I heard repentance. Like, oh, it's a terrible sermon. No, repentance. I mean, we're going to change what we believe so that we look more like Jesus in our everyday life. Amen. And God's calling us to repentance. He says, come believe on me. Come believe. Come believe. Come to me. So this morning, in a, in a, in a response to this, I think it's gonna be good. You guys can, uh, you know, there's something we do every day. Like I'll ask Rachel sometimes. Uh, and Rachel asks me sometimes the bad thing, like you know, this ugliness comes up, and Rachel will ask me simply, "Hey Andrew, what are you believing right now?" <coughs> oh, that's and sometimes I have to be honest. I'm like, okay, this is what I believe in. God's left me. I'm alone. I gotta do this on my own. You know, we'll work it through and we'll pray together. You, you can use this any any day, but. But today, as a family, as we're gathered together as family, um, I think it would be awesome if we did this together for a few moments before we end together. So we've been getting in a habit. Um, and since I got here in June, we're really emphasizing, um, and dad and mom over the last year, this is, we're a family of servant missionaries. We're in this together. We, we want to encourage one another. We want to lift one another up. And, and so, in order to do that today, we're going to break down in groups of three and four. Yeah. And we don't, you don't have to get through the whole group. Like some, you know, sometimes I feel like when I break down in three and four, then I've got to get, get everybody to share what's going on in their lives. So what, it may be that there's one person in the group that's really dealing with some, some anxiety, maybe some fear, maybe some anger. And, and they're going to share that. Hey, I, this is what I'm dealing with. And it may be an opportunity for us to just share with them the truth about God. Yeah. And you don't have to be an expert at the Word. I didn't, I didn't, and the reason why I didn't use any scriptures today, because I was like, you don't have to be an expert in the Word to work through this. But as we grow in the Lord, we're going to know exactly where in scripture that each one of these are, are, are spoken and said. So we're going to work, you know, we want to work towards that, knowing exactly where it is to work. But for now, we're going to know, know these characters about God. And it's going to produce in us. Why don't we take the next uh, 10 minutes and 
break down in groups of three and four. You don't have to know everybody in a group. You can, you know, make some people. But let's take a time and just ask Father God, hey, is there an area in my life that I need to repent? Like, that I need you to help change some belief in my heart? So I'm going to pray, and then we'll break down in groups, and then just ask the question, what are you believing? So then each one, you can maybe all share together, or maybe there's one person in the, in the circle that just says, man, this is what I'm doing. And you spend the next 10 minutes just focus on one person. That's all right. Because then during the week, you guys can do this. You know, we don't have to just do this on Sunday morning. So let me pray with you. And then go ahead and get in groups of uh, three to four. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you that you are you're calling us to believe more on you. When we believe more on you, it changes us. We thank you, Father, that we are your loved children. So, Father, as we uh, break down in groups, just confess to one another some of our unbeliefs. Father, I pray that there would be healing that takes place in our hearts, that we would believe on the truth, and we would experience freedom through experiencing the fruit of your spirit. I pray this thing. Go ahead and break down in groups of three and four. Uh, share something that God was maybe revealing to you today. And then pray for one another as we close.